Hey everyone, how's it going? In this video, we're going to rank them from 16 all the way to number one. We're going to do a civilization revolution power ranking. So let's get this started right here at number 16. I had no doubt about this one whatsoever. Some of these were tough decisions. This wasn't one of them. So I have the rent Mongols ranked at number 16 and here's why right here under ancient barbarian villagers join us. This is a terrible terrible thing to have so basically when you take a city when you take a barbarian hut uh, basically they will convert into a one population city and you get no reward from the hut this would have been a cool a pretty cool reward if it just you still got the reward and you got the city um, but that's not what happens what happens is you basically get one population city and you don't get fit a possibility for 50 gold there's no chance to get a galley there's no chance to get a tech there's no chance to get veterans I mean you don't get any of those goodies and when you don't get a spy none of that stuff you know those are so crucial to the early game that this just completely wrecks the Mongols there's just no way to recover from that for them in fact if this was removed this would actually improve them and make them pretty decent uh, and it's a shame because some of their other perks are actually pretty interesting like the 50% trade from captured cities that's actually pretty cool uh, you could actually like if you can actually manage to get a walk-in let's say you got a, a friendly village 25 gold reward and then you manage to rush a warrior and get a walk-in that would be actually pretty cool you could uh, get a 50% trade bonus that would be pretty awesome. And the cavalry speed bonus in medieval is actually pretty awesome. Three, so that's like all of your horses getting march. So if you had march plus this, you could actually move four tiles with a horse, which is amazing. It makes them capable of doing surprise attacks because no one expects anything to move three, three tiles away from uh, in the game. It's just hard to prepare for something like that. It's just very likely to surprise your opponents and two production from mountains is pretty cool too um, I really like tile passive tile bonuses like that that help make it easier to plant your cities at various locations and knowledge of communism that could be useful if you wanted to go for a culture victory and pop out a bunch of wonders it could be good um, so it's really too bad but that's that's it for them so let's move on to number 15 here which is the Russians. Let me pop this out here. So the Russians, let's move over there, check them out. So they get plus one food from planes and they start with a local map. Food from planes is basically uh, pretty close to worthless. If anything, you're not really using food in the early game. You shouldn't be. And the local map. For them to start with that, that's just pretty awful. Uh, I don't know what they were thinking. If, in my opinion, what they should have done is probably started them with a spy. I thought that would be a cool idea. But no, instead they start with a local map. And I mean, okay, so maybe you want to run around a little bit gives you slightly better intelligence about your local area and maybe you find a better spot to plant your city okay but that's nothing compared to something like what the Aztecs get which is 25 gold I mean I would way r much rather have that so and then almost everything else they have is pretty close to worthless as well uh, new defensive units receive loyalty so it's not even retroactive you would have to build a new unit and uh, that's okay but um, that's not really useful at that stage of the game it's, to a minor extent it's useful but in fact out of all of those those four listed perks right there I would say that's probably the most useful one which is pretty sad half cost riflemen I mean that's so specific what if you only have pikemen at that point that's not gonna help you Heck, you might, not, you might only have uh, archers at that point even. Maybe you didn't even get democracy yet. Maybe you were going a different route. So half defense, half cross defensive units would have been a lot better. 
I mean, Amer Americans certainly get something much better than that. They get... Well, we'll get to that later. Half-cost spies. Again, this is really late in the game. Late This late in the game, spies generally aren't that useful for me, especially in single-player, maybe in multiplayer, but... This is just terrible. None of these are very good. So I ranked them at number 14. So let's go over to number 14. Some people consider the French dead last, but I can put them at number 14. I actually like their starting cathedral, you know. I think that's pretty cool that they have such a 160 production building at such an early stage of the game. And you could actually do some kind of interesting things with the cathedral. At least, you know, in single player you could do some interesting things. Like you could run over and plant your capital close to your enemy and then you could just like overpower them with your culture you can make their city completely in unable to operate not even use their trees and you know so that's at least has some benefit and you can actually get to um, you could end up switching to monarchy to double up that culture bonus Let's say you want to play a strong culture game because sometimes I think I find culture victories are actually pretty uh, enjoyable it's really satisfying to flip enemy cities and it's really uh, it's nice to be able to when you get that great artist that he's actually useful you can flip an enemy city and there's quite a few tricks you could do to manipulate the AI even further like attacking the enemy city and then retreating to get bonuses on purpose and then flipping the city so you can do quite a bit with that when you're in a sit when you're situated in a way that you know you're the top cultural civilization in the game so you know it's not all bad and pottery's you know people joke about pottery it's bad but at least it kind of sets you up for masonry and irrigation which can be useful um though i mean not the best technology for sure but i mean it's at least it's something that's kind of useful and there may be a time when you want a wall or you want to deny the enemy to, from getting a wall. So, uh, half price roads, that's actually not too bad. There are times when you actually do want roads. And that I find the most practical use of roads is either when you're really dominating the game and you really are trying to go for a fast domination time, and you can actually build roads to network your cities together and have. Half price roads can make a really long road almost all the way across the map for like 50 or 60 gold. When you think about that, that's actually a lot more effective than you think. Especially if you're using, that, that may enable you use, to use legions instead of horses, which will make it even cheaper. So it's something worth thinking about, worth exploring. Uh, the two cannon attack, I find that to be pretty worthless in an era where you probably have tanks anyway. So something that would have been more useful would be maybe... How about, you know, plus one movement to all siege units? That would be more interesting and more in line with what people think about when they think of the French and Napoleon. Plus one rifleman movement. Uh, that's okay, I guess, but modern era, I mean, that's pretty bogus. I mean, there's so many better things that you could have given them. So it's almost borderline. That's borderline worthless. Let's move on to number 13 on the list. I'm going to put the Greek at 13. It, it's In this area of the power rankings, it gets a little bit... There's some gray area. And I could easily see some of these being shuffled around. And I know people might say, you know, the Greek at 13? Really? I mean, they start with democracy, which is pretty awesome. Here's the problem with the Greek. You start with democracy, which means you can't declare war on anybody. And what's the number one thing that makes you powerful in the ancient era? You know, you have to go out and try to take an enemy capital, get a walk-in. You're going to want to eliminate one, maybe two foes early in the game. I mean, that's what's going to get you a really good time. So starting with democracy is just kind of strange. Um, it's nice to have that technology and have access to the hoplites, uh, which is a great defensive unit. One of the, you know, at, If you want to set up a choke point, you're going to be able to do it with a hoplite for sure. Uh, just set up a fortress, and they're not going to get in for a long time without a boat. Uh, and, but, but look how confused their bonuses are. They have more great people and democracy. Now, when you when you are in democracy, you have no culture. 
because your palace generates no culture. So why do they have more great people as a bonus? It doesn't make any sense. So what, you're going to generate... <laughs> you're going to generate zero culture even faster. I mean, I guess they're assuming you're going to build temples or you're going to build... Get wonders or something else that is going to help you generate culture. I don't know. I just feel like it's they're a really confused mix of bonuses that don't really point you in any specific direction. Um, so if you're in democracy, the medieval bonus is probably doing nothing for you. So that's too bad. Half cost library. That's actually a pretty cool bonus. I'll give that to them. That's a good one. And plus food from sea regions. Kind of interesting, but really late for that to really be meaningful. And the courthouse, I find, is actually pretty cool. I like the courthouse. Starting with the courthouse is pretty nice because then it makes it even easier to run around and plant. Uh, you, feel, you feel a little more fearless. You don't feel like, oh man, am I going to have the tiles that I need? And you can even plant and have a landlocked capital and still have access to trade. So that's really cool. Um, so... Kind of a weird mix. Demo starting with democracy is cool, and you can get a nice, could get a nice start with the Greek, even without going out and conquering a capital. I mean, one option you have, you could try to get one walk in. You know, try to hit a villager hut, and then get for 25 gold, and then try to get a walk in, and then switch over to democracy. I, maybe you could do that. That's an option. At least then you'd have two cities, and then that would be pretty interesting trying to uh, see how quickly you could get tech from two starting cities. One that you captured, one that you started with. And uh, maybe it would be, you know, that would be at least interesting to see how that went. But let's move on. I put them at, again, number 13. Let's move on to number 12, which I put the Indians at number 12. This is just one of those civs I just don't... I feel like I should do better with them. They get religion in the medi medieval era. And I feel like that should be awesome. But I guess it kind of loses its steam around that time. Sort of. Um, but not really. So they start with access to all the resources. But it's this mitigated version of access to the resources. So you don't get four food from a whale. You get one food from a whale. In the ancient era so it's era dependent so once you're medieval era then you get two you get two uh, w uh, food from a whale um, kind of interesting it's a shame that it's mitigated to that extent it would be nice if maybe it wasn't mitigated so much uh, but I do understand that they had to make that decision to dial that back a little bit I totally get that um, one thing that is nice is that they could leverage oak, rubber, and oil, and uranium. You know, things that are typically not leveraged until much later in the game. The Indians can take advantage of those very early, and it can actually be pretty useful tiles for them. So that's a nice plus, actually. I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say that that's a useless thing to have. That is certainly useful. Um... But not as effective as it could be. It could be a little better. But it's a good. It's good. I'll say that. So one thing to watch out for with them is they could actually start with five production in their capital. If they actually do have oak or something like that, they could actually have pretty good production in their uh, starting city. It's just kind of rare. So it's, it doesn't happen very often. But if they, they start next to an oak tree, yeah, they could have five production. That could be pretty awesome. They could pop out a warrior every two turns. So that's cool. City's not affected by anarchy. I just feel like... In pr it sounds good on paper, but I just feel like practically speaking, it just doesn't really pay dividends the way that I would think it would. I don't change governments that often, and I don't feel the need to change governments that often. So, the thing to know about that is it doesn't even take effect until the next turn anyway, so you would have to plan one turn out. You would have to be like, okay, I want to be, I want to attack the city next turn, so I'm going to go change my government right now, and then I'll be anarchy next turn. 
I mean, I'll be anarchy this turn, and then I'll convert to fundamentalism next turn, flatten the city, change governments again, go back to democracy or whatever. Um, I could definitely see that being effective. It's just I don't think it's as useful. It doesn't. It's not as often that doesn't happen that often, I guess. It's like I find that I'm either in my attack phase or I'm not in my attack phase. Uh, I don't find myself wanting to bounce back and forth that often. I mean, I'm either focusing all my resources on libraries and everything else, or I'm focusing uh, my resources on pumping out horse armies in my... So it's like, I just find that that's not as handy, at least for me. Uh, knowledge of religion is definitely useful, especially if you've, let's say, wiped out one, maybe two opponents. And now uh, you've got five techs or more, and now maybe you could even think about taking out a third one using uh, fundamentalism, thanks to getting religion for free. That could actually be pretty handy. And the other thing about that is that can actually obsolete the oracle in case your opponent is using that against you. So that's actually nice to, nice to have on, in your favor. Uh, their best bonus is probably this one, perhaps. I mean, it's a pretty nice bonus. Half-cost settlers, that's nice. Definitely helps you explode and expand all over the map. And the only other Civ that has anything like that is probably the Americans, due to their gold rushing. Uh, and then half-cost courthouse could help with a culture victory. That's about all I can say about that, but you would have to have Magna Carta in order for that to do anything courthouse I mean how often do you really build a courthouse it's once in a while maybe if you've got a an amazing city with like some amazing tiles like four awesome resources around it but you need a courthouse to get access to all of them I could see that being pretty cool um, you know put a great scientist there got a double die city with a whale or something like that I could see that being you know somewhat handy it makes it a little bit easier to get your courthouse out there Let's move to number 11. I put the Japanese at number 11, um, which kind of even surprised me making this list. I felt like the Japanese were maybe a little stronger, but when I sat down and really looked at their abilities, I think I like their abilities, but they're not that effective. Like, I really like the plus one food from sea regions from the very beginning. I feel like that's really cool. And uh, ceremonial burial, I f that's pretty pretty worthless it would be nice if they started with a temple I think that would be a nice thing to kind of make that better and in fact that whole technology just seems kind of broken like why doesn't it give you a reward for researching it first like there's almost no reason to research it every other second tier technology gives you some kind of reward you get a you get a, a legion from iron working you get a, a free wall from masonry and you get a spy from writing, but when you research ceremonial burial, you get nothing. So what's up with that? Very strange. Um, I feel like that it should give you a free temple if you get it first, and I feel like the Japanese should get that. It kind of makes sense for them anyway. Um, so the sea regions, that's really a really nice bonus, but food is not really what you want in the ancient era. Food in general is just not that effective. It's nice to have, and growing big cities kind of feels... It's kind of fun to just grow a giant city. I don't know why it just is. It's just interesting to see how much production and science you can get out of one city. Plus, it's just easier to manage, I think. People like the ease of managing one or two or three like really huge cities. I think people prefer that. Um, so... It just makes them very flexible. It makes it easy for them to basically plop down cities all along the coastline and they don't really have to worry about too much else. Maybe, you know, worry about their production a little bit, but that's a little easy to come by when you can get food and trade from one tile type, which is almost everywhere. It's just water tiles. Now their medieval bonus is one of their better ones. It definitely helps them out in the mid game. If they can manage to get a good start, and get samurai and get knights they'll ha they have some of the best knight attack in the game they have you know obviously the plus one bonus so that definitely helps them against someone that has for example fundamentalism or something like that 
so that is definitely a, a very valid strategy for them. So they would have five attack for a knight, which would be 15 in the army. And if they're veterans, it's 22.5, and I can take them up to 30 if they get a hill or infiltration. And 37.5 if they can get all those. So, and maybe even a great general, maybe they can bring it up to 45. And then you can get a boat in there, and who knows, and then you can get, you know, pretty high in medieval era even, so pretty good. That's one of their better bonuses for sure. Knights are really powerhouses in the mid game. I mean, they're, you're always running around with knights in the mid game, so that's really useful. City is not affected by anarchy. My opinion on that hasn't changed. Basically, a, a bonus I don't find that useful, but now you're getting it even later with the Japanese. But, you know, sometimes situationally useful it could be. Uh, modern era, new defensive units receive loyalty, just as useless here as it is with the Russians. I mean, makes them a little bit better, 50% bonus. Okay, great. Um, has marginal, it's marginally useful. I'm not going to say it's useless, but it's okay, it's, thanks. I'd rather have something that, I guess I'd just prefer something that provides better attack. Because... If you're building your strategy around defense, it's just harder to eke out um, an advantage in the game. So let's move on to the Germans, who I placed at number 10. So the Germans, I put at number 10, they get some cool upgrades. They get warriors um, that are veterans, so that helps a little bit in the early game from a domination standpoint. And, okay, let me explain this. Automatic upgrades for elite units. So if you get a barracks with the Germans, and you build warriors, they will start as elites. So basically a barracks gives you plus three experience, and then them starting as veterans is also plus three experience. So now you're talking about six experience for a warrior at the start so that means you could pump out a bunch of warriors that would be elites and since they get that also combines with automatic upgrades for elite units that means all you have to do now is say build four warrior armies and then go ahead and research iron working and now you have four legion armies very cool now the problem is actually making this work actually actually executing this the way you think of it in your head it doesn't it, it sounds good on paper but some you need a lot of gold and a lot of resources to pull this off and you may fall behind a little bit in the tech game so you may feel a little discouraged when you look at the scoreboard and it's like oh i have two technologies and this guy over here has five or six but you know if you capture one or two of cities it, that may not matter anymore so that's just something to watch out for is that that whole strategy is going to make you fall behind in tech. So, I don't know, they're kind of oriented towards military, obviously, but as long as, you know, positioning is going to be really important with them, because if you're really far away and you've got legion armies marching across the map, forget it, you're just going to, it's going to be like 20 turns later, and it's going to be like a totally different army by the time they get there. They're going to be like their great, great, great grandkids, because it's thousands of years later. So, anyhow... Medieval era, one production from forest regions. This is a good bonus. Uh, and that will help them produce settlers more quickly. This is almost as cool as half-cost settlers, but not quite, because you actually have to get the production from the trees. So really it's not half-cost settlers, but it will help you build them uh, getting production the normal way. So that will help you use less gold to rush these settlers in the long run half cost barracks uh industrial era half cost barracks i kind of wish that was ancient era or even medieval that's a little bit late to get half cost barracks i mean that's definitely not useful so yeah that's kind of a thumbs down for me modern era two percent interest on gold reserves uh this one's okay I feel like the number is a little bit too small, like 2%, really? Like, what are you... 
What are you going to do? So you get 100 gold and you get 2 free gold. Okay. Great. That's okay, but... That's barely uh, anything getting excited about. So That's the Germans at number 10. Let's move on to number 9. This one is a really interesting one. So the Egyptians are the wild card of civilization and revolution. In fact, I would rank them anywhere from 3 to 15th, depending on how things start out for them. So I put them kind of in the middle. They're around it. I'm going to put them at 9. So they start with four different wonders. They have the chance to start with one of four different wonders. One is the Stonehenge. That's the worst one. You don't want that one. If you start with Stonehenge, that's too bad. You're pretty much playing as the French, or an even worse version of the French. Uh, if you start with Colossus, well, that's the best possible thing you could have got, and I would rank that very high. Maybe number three, number two, perhaps. That's a very powerful um, thing to get. They can also start with Oracle. I would rank that pretty high as well. I would say, wow, that's cool. Starting with Oracle. Maybe I would rank that around number six or something like that. And, and then the last one they can get is the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. And that's basically like starting as the Chinese, but with plus culture. So you start with three population in that case. Um, I would put that somewhere around 10th or 11th, I guess. That's a nice thing to get, but I don't like... It's just not that great. But it's good. It's good. I'll say it's good. Having three population in your starting city is really handy. Especially if you've got, say, three water and three forest. That's awesome to have. Uh, because you basically you can pump out six production at the earliest stage of the game. Only China. China is the only other civilization that can do that. And then when you're done with your production phase, swap it over to three water. That's the ideal situation. Then you could get six tech from your, from your capital. So that's really cool. I really like the Egyptians. They're really cool. They're dynamic. You know, they almost, it's kind of like you never know. You know, There's always a little bit exciting when you plant Thebes. And you're like, oh man, what, what am I going to get here? Please give me something good. And you basically just hope you don't get Stonehenge. Because that's the worst of the worst. And I don't know what they were thinking when they put that in the game. That thing is so awful. Anyway. All of these bonuses are interesting. Um, so Ancient Era, they get plus one food and trade from desert regions. Let me tell you, I love this bonus. I think this is so cool. This is. I think they should have done more of this when they designed the game. Uh, I, like, I, for example, I thought it would be cool if they gave the Mongols plus one plus one food, plus one, you know, maybe pl plus one production to hills or something like that. You know, just a way to make tiles more dynamic and interesting based on what civilization you are. I like that they gave them the food and the trade in desert regions. So basically, you could have a landlocked capital with five desert tiles, and you would be doing very well, especially if you have the Colossus. You would be racking up crazy amounts of technology. Plus, you could then also rush it. If you go and you get uh, Code of Laws first, uh, you'll end up getting a free trading post. And from that point, you would have plus two trade on top of that. So now you would have four trade per tile and one food. And, I mean, I, I've done games like... I've done a few videos like that where you basically play Oasis World and you just go bananas with Thebes. You, you can just, it's just amazing what you can get away with with the Egyptians. I love them. I love this bonus. It's very cool. How effective is it? I would say fairly effective because it makes it much easier to find a place to plant, a capital. It makes it easier. You don't have to worry about water so much. Now, if you do want access to the water, you are going to have to build a... Uh, by a, a water tile but maybe you don't need that maybe you can just get water access through one of your uh, expansions so it's not really a big deal knowledge of irrigation i find this one annoying super annoying and irritating so it's kind of a, a mixed bag here for the egyptians irrigation okay so you get this bonus but then you don't get the plus one benefit from it 
Uh, normally, when you get irrigation first, you get plus one. Uh, you get plus one population to all your cities. And uh, that's a really awesome bonus to get. It's one that you do want to get, but when the Egyptians try to get it, they don't they don't get that bonus. So, like, I don't understand why. There's a lot of weird little bugs like that in this game. Uh, so that's just frustrating for them. Uh, the other two bonuses aren't so great. The Riflemen and the Caravan Gold. Psh, total garbage. I don't know. Maybe you can fire up a game where you do caravans only. Let's do a caravan only game and see how many... Uh, if I can sit, <laughs> get an economic victory by sending 100 caravans to my opponent's door. I don't know. So that's just weird. Anyway, so let's move on to the Romans at number 8. I put these guys at number 8. Romans are interesting, have very cool bonuses. Uh, I put them smack dab right here in the middle at number 8. They start with Code of Laws, which is probably one of the most important technologies in the game. That means they can start their expansion phase whenever they please. Of course, domination and exploring and wiping out barbarian huts and villager huts and wiping out as many capitals as you can early in the game is more important than expanding but you could start expanding right away if you really wanted to like you could just <laughs> switch you could just plant your capital and start working trees and just start building settlers if you really wanted to i wouldn't do that but you could there's nothing stopping you plus you could also get, uh, take advantage of their half half price roads now, I feel like this is an underappreciated perk. One that I, perhaps, me personally, underappreciates. I, I feel like there, you could do a lot with that. Like, you can build a really, really, really long road, like I said with the French, for like, a, like 50 gold. It's really cheap with them. And you can put that all the way across the map from one capital all the way to another capital. And then you can have like a nice net... <clears throat> nice network of roads that um, puts you very close to an enemy capital. So you'd have to be mindful of where you put your expansions, where you put your settlers. Let me talk a little bit about their half cost wonders perk. This is an awesome perk. This is unbelievable. I mean, being able to build East India Company for 100 production is a, an amazing thing. Let me move this over here. And, uh, it sets them up very well, obviously, for a culture victory path. Um, oh, actually, even for tech, really, you can leverage it in a lot of ways. Depends on what you did with it. But this one's amazing. In fact, I've even had the, the computer abuse this one on me. I've lost to the computer. The Romans built so many wonders that they actually ended up beating me. This was in a game where I had a bunch of different constraints, but still, nevertheless, they still pumped out so many, so much culture that they actually ended up having a culture victory. Unbelievable. In fact, they, uh, even the, even the World Bank is, ends up only being 250 hammers for them. I believe that's true, so. And the UN as well. So, industrial, it's more great people. Now, see, this makes sense because they're culturally, kind of a culturally aligned civilization. So this makes sense. With the Greek, it didn't make sense because you have, you're probably sitting around in democracy and you don't have culture. But with the Romans, you're probably in republic or um, maybe even monarchy. Who knows? Maybe you're, or maybe you went for... I don't know. Maybe even communism. I don't know if communism would be that great of a choice. Because then you wouldn't get the culture, but... But yeah, anyway. Maybe you're in... I would think you're in Republic for most of the game with them. But it depends on what you're trying to do, so... And then new cities have plus one population. This is a late game thing. Kind of cool. Not bad. Um... Uh, but, okay, not the best perk, but that's cool. I could help a little bit. Let's move on to number, my personal number seven. 
I'll put the English at number seven. They're interesting. They're interesting. Um, I like that they start with monarchy, and and they start with a monarchy government. They start with access to dye, a very good technology. Uh, sometimes it's hard to get access to dye that early, but if you can, it's a huge, a huge thing to have. Now, the cool thing about monarchy is, if you're smart, you can get knights pretty quickly with them, because knight is one of, knight is one of the prerequisites for feudalism. And then, uh, so basically, if you get horseback riding, and you already have monarchy, so now you can... If you're getting 14 tech a turn, you can actually get access to feudalism, which is 140 tech. So all you got to do is you got to get 100, is get 14 tech per turn. That's all you got to do, and then you can use a great scientist and rush feudalism. And that can happen real fast, especially if you took an enemy capital. I mean, that's an enemy capital. That's your expansion and your own capital. So you only need three cities to get 14 tech a turn. So, yeah, if you could pull, you, I mean, what year would that even be? That'd be like, you could be like 2000 BC running around with knights potentially. Plus they start with that monarch because it also helps because you get monarchy and uh, you're going to get your first great person even faster. So that's really interesting. And that's something I should probably do a video on in the future. Naval combat in medieval era. This is an Oh, actually, let me, I skipped one. The Longbow Archer. Best defensive unit in the game, especially for Ancient Era. Only 10 production, plus one defense. So basically, you have hoplite defense for archer cost. You can't beat this, and makes them one of, probably the best defensive, yeah, I would say they're the best defensive civ in the game. It's If they wanted to set up a choke point, they could easily do that. Three defense plus fortification plus um, what do they call it? Fortifying status or whatever. So that's nine. And then if you're veteran, I mean, yeah, so they could have like a super high defense. You're basically going to need like a legion army to even compete with one archer. I mean, so you know, you're probably going to want that would hold them off to like knights or even higher. Maybe catapults, but that it, that could possibly break through. But it would have to be veterans. It would be, a, you know, a close one. So awesome defensive unit. Medieval era, uh, they get naval combat plus one. This is a nice bonus. Uh, helps the British along with the Spanish be sort of the uh, the best in terms of naval warfare. And if you can control the seas, you know that could be a huge that could be a huge thing that flips the game in your favor. Because if you go and you got a galley full of um, someone sneaks up on you and they discover your galley full of all kinds of units and they attack, um, or you attack, or what, or whatever the case is, I mean you could wipe out their whole army if you find their uh, transport coming to your capital or something like that. That's definitely huge. If, you know, if that basically make you a two-on-one with a galley, or what's that? I guess a galleon would be like two attack, I believe. I can't remember right now, but I don't attack with boats that often. So, excuse me. Yeah, anyway, it's a good bonus. It's a good thing to have. You always want... And you, if you can get veteran too, that would be nice. You don't want to build non-veteran boats, unless it's a galley. That's about it. Uh, plus one production from hills. This one's okay. It's somewhat useful, but not great. So, really the best thing that the English get. This is probably the best late game bonus. Naval support doubled. So this makes them a late game powerhouse. If they can get like a fleet of cruisers or a fleet of battleships, would be even better. 
They, uh, I mean, I don't even know how you stop them. No one else gets anything like this, so... I would go as far to say that's the best modern era bonus. I can't think of one that's better. You know, that'd be an interesting idea. If I could pick one of these from each category, one of these perks, what would be the best for each each category? Perhaps I'll do a different video on that one. So anyway, that's the English at number seven. Let's move to number six, the Arabs. So the Arabs are a strong sieve. Militarily, they've got the uh, fundamentalism from the from turn one. So you plant the city, build your first warrior, you've got two attack instead of one. So that is huge. That is a huge bonus to have early in the game. And that's part of why they're so high on this list. Pretty much the main reason they're that high on this list. Caravan gold plus 50%. Uh, okay. Maybe you'll get a gold, maybe you'll get a caravan. And you'll get 75 instead of 50. Okay. You generally don't get that bonus that early though. So I feel like caravans kind of come like a little bit later. Like you never hit your first barbarian hut and get a caravan. I can't, it's very rare. So I'm not quite sure how that works off the top of my head, but I feel like that's like gotta be like your second or your third thing. So it could be kinda handy, but it's not like what makes them good. Nevertheless, you know, getting that extra 25 gold would be great. And that would be kinda interesting to do a uh, caravan economic victory. I've never explored that, but I've always wondered about that. I would have to do some math and figure out if that's even worth pursuing. So medieval era knowledge of math. Uh, okay, this is great. Uh, one complaint I do have is you don't get a free catapult. What's up with that? Why not? You should get a free catapult, but you don't get it. So, nevertheless, it makes it easier to get to navigation, which is good, and this also makes it possible. Um, no, that's not the truth. Well, you can get catapults a little faster with them. So basically you could research the bottom four. You could, with 80 science, basically you research the four lowest techs and then you'll have math because at that point you have five. So you can get catapults really fast with the Arabs. Kind of interesting. You might want to research that a little bit. It could be an interesting strategy in multiplayer or something like that. The only problem is getting the boat. Well, from there, I guess you could just build... If you got a barracks, you could build what? A catapult army? And then... I don't know. Maybe if you wanted to, even continue to navigation. Maybe. Maybe if you got enough caravans running around giving you all kinds of gold then you could get a whole bunch of you can get a fleet of galleons and then you could get an army of catapults man that would be awesome you would definitely ruin someone's day if you rolled up to their capital with that something to think about industrial era horseman knight attack plus one this one is awesome i love this one because you could i think i've had a horse with like 40 plus attack before a horse army i mean this is just awesome plus combine it with fundamentalism you're talking so what horse army is six attack then you do fundamentalism it's nine with this it's up to 12 and then you can get infiltration for 18 and then you can get veteran for 24. uh how did i get that high i don't know but i did i guess it must have been like a great gem must add a general plus a hill yeah i think i've had that before and then you get like a, a a steam, uh, a fleet of steam, a fleet of cruisers. Thank you. So 
So anyway, you can do crazy amounts of damage with even just a regular horse army. And then if you get knights, that's even better. So, Arabs have awesome bonuses. And then 2% interest on gold reserves. Eh, it's okay. And, uh, you know, I was recently thinking, what's better? 2% interest on gold reserves or the plus 50% gold bonus and that might sound like an outrageous thing to say but here's the thing about the 50% gold bonus is it causes 50% inflation so it's like is that even helping you I'm not sure that it is if you have 50% inflation on everything then I, I don't know that that's really helping you that much it's just making the numbers bigger anyway with 2% it doesn't make the numbers bigger, there's no inflation, you just get free gold. So, moving back to Spanish at number 5. I put them at number 5. You start with navigation, one of the coolest decks you can possibly start with. You have galleons from the very beginning. Very awesome, very awesome. And it makes it easy for them to get Atlantis in every game. They can get it first. And they could also uh, leverage whales. They could find a double whale city if they wanted to. And they also get explore exploration cash doubled. Now, some might overlook this, but this is awesome. This is an awesome bonus. Let me tell you why. So this makes it really, really much, it's so much easier to get a walk-in, a walk-in on an enemy capital, the AI specifically. So you start with zero gold, right? But if you get a natural wonder, say you name your river or whatever, that's 20 gold. Well, guess what? That's a free warrior. So now you're almost like the Aztecs at this point. But you have to find a natural wonder. So basically you're running around, you hit a tile, boom, you got it. So now you got two ways to get that free warrior when you're running around. So it makes it a very, gives them a very high chance of getting an, 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 uh, a walk-in on an enemy capital. And once you get good at walk-ins, you're gonna find out you can get them like all the time, even on deity. And I'm gonna do a separate video on that, so stay tuned for that. Medieval plus one naval combat, just as awesome here as it is for the English. Great bonus to have. You don't want to lose a boat, ever. Industrial, plus 50% gold production. Excuse me. So this is a cool bonus. I kind of have weird feelings about it because then, okay. Okay, let's say you're getting 100 gold per turn. Now it's 150. All right, that sounds cool. Or is it? I don't know. Because the library that used to cost you 120, now it costs 180. So it's like, what did that really buy you? I don't know. You could hit milestones faster, I guess, if you don't rush anything. Okay. Like, that's because it's kind of weird. That guy's not the whole point of gold in the first place. Just to rush things. So I don't know. It's kind of, I just kind of weird. I, it's good. I think it's a kind of good. I don't know. To be honest, I don't think I like it. And if you have any uh, insight on, on that, that's further on that, I mean, I would love to hear a comment about that. I kind of feel like I like the 2% gold better. Because that's free gold. There's no catches. You know, nothing like that. Gold's for rushing stuff, folks. That's what it's for. So I don't, I don't think I like that bonus that much. Plus one production from hills man they are so similar to the English the English have this one too and it's uh, just like them uh, it's, a, it's an okay bonus I don't find it that useful honestly but it helps a little bit all right so let's move on to number four Ta-da! it's the Aztecs and a special Note about the Aztecs, I will say they're number one if you're a new player. If you're a new player, pick the Aztecs. 
they and the reason I say that is they heal after every fight every victory so and I just feel like that is a huge thing for new people like I don't think they really totally the healing thing that whole mechanic is tough for new players I think especially when you're invading in uh, an enemy's cultural boundaries so I put them at number four they start with uh, 25 gold which is awesome that's an awesome bonus to have because it makes it very easy to g walk yourself around go to an enemy capital and get an easy AI walk-in on their enemy capital it's almost guaranteed in fact if you're practicing walk-ins on enemy capitals this is the ca this is the sieve to do it with because they start with 25 gold healing after combat victory by far one of probably the number two coolest perk in the entire game I think number one being the super broken Americans rushing gold rushing costs uh, half cost rushing as they call it medieval temples produce three science this is okay especially if you get Ark of the Covenant it could be pretty cool help you get a faster tech victory or whatever kind of victory industrial half price roads this one's not too bad um, it could make it easier to network your empire together um, and you know that can make it easier to defend with fewer units as well because they can run their little armies around if they really wanted to so that's not too bad of a bonus it's okay and then 50% gold production I feel the same way about that as I do <laughs> with the Spanish and the Zulu so very cool sieve love them fun to use too so let's move to number three the Zulu the Zulu I feel I have a lot of weird feelings about these guys they they're awesome but so cheesy they are so cheesy I personally think plus one warrior movement was a mistake to put in the game at all I don't think that should have been allowed I think that should have been for legions maybe not warriors In fact, I would think half-cost warriors would have been better <laughs> than plus one warrior movement. Just getting across the map that fast with your warriors is so... Having something with two, two movement that early is such an advantage. So they start with overrun. So basically, that's a pretty cool thing to have. So if you have a four to one advantage, you instantly win. That's cool. Nice thing to have. And then ancient is that, again, that warrior movement. So, I mean, you can, and you can even combine that overrun advantage with the warrior movement. So you could basically go out, hit a villager hut, 25 gold. Okay, now plant your city two tiles away from a village, from a barbarian hut. All right, now you've taken down that one flag barbarian hut. Okay, now you got 50 gold from that. Okay, now you can rush a warrior. All right, now you've got two warriors, and it's only been like three, four turns or whatever. And then you can go uh, and basically have a the next turn you could have a rush another warrior, and then you'll have a warrior army running around, basically overrunning barbar barbarian huts wherever he goes. And you probably can take a capital out at that point uh, because you're going to be close enough by that time, potentially. Uh, so those two bonuses work very well together and it gives them a pretty <coughs> excuse me a pretty nice advantage medieval rapid city growth this is okay not that great not something that i really see is like a big advantage for them the 50 gold production is good but not amazing just like i said with the spanish and well not really good about like I said, it's not really good, but like I said, I had kind of mixed feelings about it. Seems good, but I don't think it's actually that good. And then modern half-cost riflemen. Okay. Could help them pump out a ton of riflemen. That's for sure. 
But anyway, the, really the key for the Zulu is they can explore and conquer the map so fast and rake in so much gold that their opponents have a hard time recovering from that. And that the Zulu can afford to be uh, a little more wasteful just because they have so much gold working in their favor. And they can afford to lose a fight or two. They don't care. What do they, they, they got 150 gold in the bank. They don't, they'll just keep sending more. Kind of remind me of like StarCraft. Kind of remind me of the Zerg. Where you just keep sending Zerglings until you win. So, kind of a similar concept. Let's go to number two. The Chinese. So the Chinese start with writing. Which is cool because it is uh, on the way to one of the most important texts of the game. Code of Laws. Uh, so that's nice. The bummer is they don't start with a spy. But okay, whatever. Nevertheless, you get a 40, 40 beaker tech for free. So that's cool. Not too bad. New cities have plus one population. That means all cities, basically, is what it should say. So when you start your first city, instead of two population, you get three. So that's amazing. And that applies to every single city. It's not like the Egyptians where you get a hanging garden, hang, hanging garden of Babylon. Hanging gardens of Babylon? And uh, you get that one population from one city like no you get it for every city in the whole game that like you ever plan you can make 50 cities and all of them would be plus one which is totally amazing so no one gets anything else like this that's a pretty insane advantage i mean think about it, that's a 50 percent advantage in terms of anything production trade uh growth i mean whatever the heck they want to work on that's a pretty insane bonus, and I kind of scratch my head about that and think, well, how is that even fair <laughs> at all? Who thought that would be a great idea? I don't know what they were thinking when they put that in there. That's pretty broken, pretty OP, and you get it from turn one. So, that makes them very flexible, very powerful. They can pretty much take that... Uh, Take the population bonus and just apply it to anything that they want. It's very good. Medieval, they get knowledge of literacy. This is yet another awesome, what is that, an 80? A 60? I can't remember if it's 60. I think it's 60 beakers to get literacy. Yeah, 60. That's another good technology that everyone wants. It's plus one tech to all of your cities. And that bonus, I believe, actually works with the Chinese. The uh, researched first bonus. So that's another good one for them. And then they also get half-cost libraries. Another good technology. Makes it sets them up very well for a tech victory. And then that all synergizes very well with uh, all their own all their other bonuses. And then modern cities not affected by anarchy. Whatever, it doesn't matter. By that time, you probably already got it all planned out anyway. So it's probably not, a, not really going to help you. So let's talk about number one. My number one civilization in this game is the Americans. Um, they're harder to use effectively, but I will say that you can do things with them that no one else can really do. And let's kind of talk about that. So 2% interest on gold reserves. All right, that's not the reason they're overpowered. That's an okay thing to have the entire game. Kind of cool. But starting with a great person, okay. It's a random great person, so it really depends on what you get here. It's kind of like the Egyptians. You don't know what wonder you're getting, and you also don't know what great person you're getting. So you could start with a Colossus. Um, with the Egyptians, and in the Americans' case, you could start with, I don't know, great builder, great scientist. You could start with a great leader. You could start with a great artist, a great explorer. Now, all of those have something interesting you could do with them. If you, I mean, yeah, if you start with a great artist, that's a bummer, probably not the best thing. But, you know, you could at least use them to run around and explore. They have two movement. Or you can even sell them for 15 gold if you decided you don't even want to use that. 
You can run them around, get map knowledge, you can hit huts, you can do all kinds of stuff. Okay. Uh, you can find enemy capitals, help your early units explore, find dead ends that you wouldn't have otherwise known about, and then, then your new units know to go to another another direction. Um, so even that's that's with a great artist, that's a worst case scenario. But then if you get a, something like a great explorer, I mean, you can pop out three warriors on the first turn because you could rush a galley um, with your great builder and then swap it to warriors and you'll have three three warriors running around on turn one or you could just run next to your an enemy capital and do it there and uh, it's easy to underestimate what you can do with a great person from turn zero you got don't take for granted that you can move two spaces with them you can do a lot with that that means you could do uh, flip do the unit flipping and then you could move you know move them to your settlers two spaces and then put the great person right on top of them in the same tile and then f do the little flipping thing and then plant there you know that's a really th nice thing to have that can save you a turn so there's a lot of little tricks you can use with them then great explorer 50 gold on your first turn are you kidding me i mean that's amazing you can uh how many that's like two and a half warriors so almost as good as the great builder scenario and then a humanitarian okay not the best but you would have plus one population so it's kind of like uh english and the egyptians starting with the hanging gardens um so that's cool or you can even end up saving him well what you could do with the, with the humanitarian is you could run around um scrape together 25 gold which is easier to do because you have two units you can find those named tiles a little more easily and then you could uh, take an enemy capital and then reuse your humanitarian and then you'll have two three population cities which would be bonkers at an early stage of the game so you know there's a lot of amazing things you could do with the americans at that or in that first ancient era but really where they hit their stride is medieval once they hit medieval era, this is the best bonus in the whole game, hands down. Hands down. And the fact that they get 2% interest on all gold makes it even better. Because they just like, seems like they never run out of gold. So they can rush at half price, it says, but it's not really half price. It's really more like half price in the ancient, in the era prior to this one. Because it's like, I think it's a bug, if you ask me. So, let's pretend you're in medieval era. How much does it cost to rush a settler? 60 gold, right? Well, for the Americans, it's 20. Well, how could that be? Well, if it was ancient era, it would be 40 gold. And half cost of that would be... 20 so really I think what happens is I think this is a bug and I think they coded it wrong to use the era minus one so if you're in medieval medieval era in programming let's say z ancient is zero and medieval is one right so I think what happens is they grab the cost of zero instead of grabbing the current era they got current era minus one so it's, so i think they basically got i think i believe if you opened up that code i believe i believe that's exactly what you're gonna see because that's a, that's exactly what it's doing in the game because if it's industrial area era should be 80 gold well okay you would think all right so maybe it's a uh, 40 gold or whatever but i think it's actually 30 or something like that is that right in any case point is it's so damn cheap everything that's just not even settlers that's the thing it's all units everything all all archers all pikemen it doesn't matter horsemen everything everything's super cheap so you can build a horse army for 60 gold. 
which is totally crazy. And it applies to buildings. No, no, it does not. Thank goodness it does not apply to buildings. That would be absolutely crazy. Thank goodness. So a half price units only. And then industrial plus one food from planes and then, which is okay. And then factories triple production. That could actually be handy when you're trying to build uh, the World Bank or some late stage wonder or something like that. Like uh, usually World Bank, usually use it to finish up the World Bank or the UN. But really the key here is the leveraging that rush units at half price. That thing is off the charts. So good. Can't beat it. So that's it, folks. That's my ranking. That is my official Civilization Revolution power ranking. Um, I'd be interested to hear what you think of my official rankings. Uh, and this has been, uh, I've been thinking about this a long time, so I doubt I would change my list around too much. It's about, I'm pretty happy with this list, so. Uh, let me know what you think. I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you guys next video.